So welcome to the uh, ECF tonight, this first service for the year. My name is Phil, and along with Sharon, I'll be pastoring the church next month. Come on! Oh, yeah. My church, at Dool United, I am still the end of the, till the 31st of January, maybe take two weeks leave, except there's up to leave before I start. So this week I have been very busy watching the cricket. Yeah. So, all cricket it out. And I really should be, I'd normally be watching it right now probably, they would be just finishing here. So hopefully Australia's still two or three down and we're miles in front. But I'm very really enjoying this week, watching the cricket. And um, tonight, and, and look, thank you David, and David, and Max. Where's Matt for Yeah, yeah. Oh Matt, sorry Matt, yeah. Thank you for leading us tonight, it was fantastic. Yes. stuff and some old stuff and some new and it was just great worship too but thank you for leading it was great yeah so to, today or this evening I want to kick off 2021 um, thinking about a word called Thanksgiving now when we think of Thanksgiving I often go back to the original Thanksgiving in America or you were saying in Canada and uh, we're not like, talking about America this week, but I'm going to talk a little bit about America because in 1621, the Mayflower, Mayflower settled in America and what became the first Thanksgiving. And I want to read you an excerpt from one of the captains, Cap Captain Miles Standish, from his logbook on, this is on, on Thanksgiving. 1621, Captain Miles Standish had been much at his wife's Rose's bedside. As much time, that is, as he could spare from stalking game, guarding against savages and felling trees to construct crude homes on shore. A bitter wind whistled through chinks and cracks in the Mayflower, anchored in Plymouth Harbour, that winter of 1620-21. Rose's chills would turn to uncontrollable shaking, and just as suddenly her body would be ablaze with fever. Herbs from the surgeon's chest did little to relieve her. By spring, only five wives remained out of the 18 who had sailed to Plymouth. Rose was not among them. Thanksgiving, what was that? The golden dreams of a new world that Miles and Rose had cherished together had evaporated into hollow hopes. And yet that fall, Captain Standish joined other bereaved pilgrims in the first Thanksgiving celebration. See, the real test of thankfulness is whether we can give thanks from the heart for what we do have, despite the wounds and pains of yesterday's struggles. I'll read that again. The real test of thankfulness is whether we can give thanks from the heart for what we do have, despite the wounds and pains of yesterday's struggles. Ours is not some fair weather faith, but a resilient trust in the midst of pain. The pilgrims live close to the edge of survival. Perhaps that is why they were so thankful. So the tradition of thanksgiving came out of life of hardship, death, and daily struggles. And so often we see thanksgiving as a time to give thanks for the good things. And there's nothing wrong with that, the good things that have happened. But the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 AD, give thanks in all circumstances. <coughs> That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm not looking at you, I'm just saying. <laughs> <just, laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? <laughs> All circumstances, we've got to give thanks. And we'll never forget that, will you, David? <laughs> we'll remember that Thanksgiving. And you know, there's some great prayers of Thanksgiving in the Bible as we read. We think of Mary's prayer. We think of the prayer of King Jehoshaphat, the prayer of Daniel, the prayer of David. Today I want to talk about a thanksgiving prayer that comes out of the Old Testament and it's found in 1 Samuel and it's a prayer of a lady called Hannah. And I want to look at that story today and we're going to read the story of Hannah. We're going to find it in 1 Samuel. I'm going to read that to you now, 1 Samuel 1, 1 to 21. Okay, so this is in the time of the judges, a long time ago in the Old Testament. There was a certain man from Ramathan, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. 
Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all his sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will be ever used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they rose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we've read your word, as we've looked at the story of Hannah, and Lord, as we look at that word today, thankfulness or thanksgiving. Lord, may we have a heart that is full of thanksgiving. And Lord, as we read your word today, as we study your word, as we look at this story, Lord, help us to see the importance of knowing to love you and to honour you and to be thankful for no matter what you throw in front of us. Sometimes they're tough times, Lord. Sometimes, even now, we're going through tough times. But Lord, I pray that through your word and through your spirit, we will see that you will come through for each one of us in your time. You will come through for each one of us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we know that Hannah lived in the time of the judges. She was married to Elkanah. He had two wives, which was quite common back then, Hannah and Peninnah. We know Peninnah had children, Hannah had none, because the Lord had closed her womb. That's what the Bible tells us. The Lord had closed her womb. And in Hannah's day, it was a real stigma attached to childlessness. You were a social outcast. It was one of the worst afflictions that could be had for a woman to be childless. And Hannah was one of those ladies. And this lady, Penina, her offsider, or Kana's other wife, made sure that Hannah felt the full effect of being barren as she regularly taunted her about having no children. Maybe it's because she knew that Elkanah had a special relationship with Hannah, because we read that in verse 5, where it says, But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. Or maybe she was just jealous, we don't know. But every year she got taunted, every year she got provoked, and every year she was sad. And the Bible says she was so sad she couldn't eat. So, how did Hannah respond? Well, we read in verse 10, it actually says, In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And you know, maybe 2021 20, for us is a time where we need to get to 
at that stage of being bitter in soul. And what that means is we pour out our heart. See, sometimes we just pray. You know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you're told to pray before you go to bed. So, you know, you pray for mum, dad, grandma, grandpa, and all these other things. And yes, it was nice, and it taught us to go into a rope of praying, and that's great. But this particular prayer that Hannah prayed was a prayer that came from the heart. It came out of anguish. It came out of bitterness. Now, the word bitter means Mara. If you look it up in the Old Testament, there's a, there's a story of the, 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 the bitter waters of Mara. Bitterness, it's a tough thing to go through. Bitterness happens when things aren't going our way. But bitterness can be turned around. And that's what happened in Hannah's circumstance. She turned this bitterness around. Each year, she went to the yearly sacrifice. There's a routine we can see happening, a pattern. Each year, she went to the yearly sacrifice. Each year, she got taunted by Penelope. But each year, she prayed to the Lord. You know, sometimes the circumstances are in, uh, could take years. For Hannah, it was a yearly thing. Every year, she went up to the festival, a time where it should have been celebrated, a time where it was a bit, a bit like my brother. Every year, he comes up, we just met him today. He comes up from Crystal Brook and goes to Victor Harbour to spend some time with friends and family. And it's a special time where they can catch up with friends and family. And Hannah, it should have been a special time, but it was a time where she got taunted by Penina every time, and it just made her unhappy, downcast. So we see a pattern, the yearly sacrifice, the taunts, but the prayers. And that's what I want to encourage us today, the prayers, the prayers that come from the heart. That's what Hannah prayed, a prayer from the heart. Because one day, God answered her prayer. We read in 1 Samuel 12 that Hannah was praying to the Lord and Eli the priest actually thought she was drunk. Because the Bible tells us that she was praying with him uh, from her heart. So he thought, what's this babbling going on? Nothing's happening. He just assumed she was drunk. But she wasn't. She was praying from her heart. Praying a prayer of anguish. A prayer from the heart. And it's interesting because sometimes we say, can God answer these prayers? But I want to tell you, King David, who went through a lot of angst himself, tells us that a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. In other words, he was saying that if you pray a prayer from the heart that you really mean, in a prayer out of anguish and bitterness, God will hear that prayer. And he heard Hannah's prayer. And Eli was able to recognise that this lady is feeling him. She's praying a heartfelt prayer. And he acknowledged that because he said to her, Go in peace, may the God of Israel grant you your request. And what does it say in verse 18? Her face was no longer downcast. Her countenance changed, some versions say. And sometimes it's the word of a person. It could be a friend. It could be the minister. It just could be a relation. But sometimes it's that word that's needed. See, Eli could have left it there said, you stupid woman, get out, you're drunk. But no, he made a mistake, he realised. And he prayed, he basically said words over her, in other words, say, may you go away blessed. May God hear your prayer. And that totally changed her. When she walked out of that situation with Eli, her face was different, her body language was different. And I've seen it over and over again, when people a fair deed to God. And they pray and they reach out. And, and that prayer is acknowledged. And especially when someone comes up to them to support them. Which is what Eli did. He supported Hannah. And her countenance, everything changed. She was a different woman from then on. See, Hannah's prayer was answered. And we know she had a son. She named him Samuel. And in verse 20 it says, So in the course of time, so in other terms, in other words, I say, in God's time. And this is a critical part of the story. In God's time. See, because if I was to give you the whole story, you'd have years and years and years of taunting. Years and years of going to the festival. Years and years of prayer. But in God's time, something happened. So as we go into 2021, I want to ask you some questions. Is God aware of a young mother's plight, waiting despondently for a baby? Does he know about unhappy home situations? Does he know about bullying and harassment? 
Does he know about big mortgages, broken down cars, things going wrong, financial mishaps? The list goes on. And I want to tell you today through Hannah's story, through God's word, that yes, he does. He hears. He knows. He understands. He hears. And he responds. I'll say that again. He knows. He understands. He hears. And he responds with three words. In his time. Sometimes we forget about that, don't we? I think of the story of Abraham and Sarah. An amazing story where God told them that they were going to be blessed, that they were going to have a family, that they were going to start a whole generation of people, a whole generation of Israelites. And yet Abraham and Sarah couldn't see how it could work. What did they do? They used Sarah's maid servant and had a son. That son happened to be Ishmael. To this day, the Arabs, who is Ishmael, fight with the Israelites. They took God in their hands, didn't they? They tried to play God. Hannah didn't play God. She waited in God's time. It is so critical not to play God. He knows what we need. He knows in his time that he will bring things to pass. He hears and he responds in his time. Because we know Hannah waited years and years for God to answer her prayer. It was in his time because we know that God's timing is perfect. You know, you have to ask Joseph, or Rahab, or Ruth, or David, Esther, the list goes on. If you read those stories, you see that it was in his time these things happened. Can you imagine Rahab, if she hadn't put out the red scarlet, uh, the, the, the cloth on the side wall, her family would have been killed. What about Joseph, if he decided to stay in prison, say, well, that's it, I'm staying, I'm sick of it, I'm just going to stay here. He wouldn't have become Prime Minister of Egypt. In his time. So important to remember that. Hannah named her son Samuel. And it means heard of God. Because God heard her voice. It's a beautiful name, isn't it? And through her son, Hannah testified that God hears and answers our prayers. You can read her prayer in 1 Samuel 2, maybe this week. Go to the next chapter and read 1 Samuel 2, a beautiful prayer of adoration. And in this prayer, this was the prayer she prayed as she went to the temple to give up her son to Eli, the priest. Now you think about it, she's had the baby. Now, isn't that funny how you sort of, you, you get a prayer answer, you've been praying and praying, then God answers your prayer, and then you think, right. She could have easily said, right, that's it, we're not going to the festival anymore, I've got the son, I'm happy. I don't know what would have happened because Samuel was the judge of Israel for years and years and years. He led Israel. So she gave up her son. The Bible says she was weaned. She missed one of the festivals while she was weaning. So probably at the age of two, maybe three, she took her only son, took him back to the temple and gave him to Eli because she honoured. She basically said, I'm giving this child to serve the Lord. And that's exactly what Samuel did. And that's an incredible thing to think that she gave up her only son. Hannah showed a depth of commitment and love for God that really humbles me. On this day, she made the biggest sacrifice her life, in her life, and yet she rejoiced in the Lord. You read 1 Samuel 2, you see it's a, a, it's a song and a prayer of rejoicing. Five words, out of sacrifice comes thanksgiving. I don't know if I made that up or read it or Read some of it. It's pretty profound, but I'll, I'll just say I found that in the book just in case. So, out of sacrifice comes thanksgiving. When we have nothing left to rejoice in, we can still rejoice in the Lord. See, Hannah kept her promise to God. She gave up her son, gave him back to God. And you know what? Over the years, the Bible tells us she had three sons and two daughters that she was able to keep because God honoured her in her commitment, in giving up her only son. She ended up having three sons and two daughters. And she no longer got that pestering from Penina every year. And let's hope she forgave her because it was terrible what Penina did to her every year, just kept pestering her and annoying her because she was probably jealous because of the love that she saw that her husband, other, that the husband had for her, not for Penina. As we look at the life of Hannah, we see a simple pattern that she followed throughout her life. 
And maybe this is a pattern we can take into 2021. Firstly, she poured her heart out to God. Secondly, she waited for the Lord. Thirdly, she accepted the child Samuel as a gift from God. And finally, she gave him back to God. She poured out her heart to God. She waited for the Lord. She accepted the child Samuel as a gift from God. And then she gave him back to God. So as we look into 2021, am I prepared to make sacrifices this year? Because as we look out today, we look out on the south coast, we see the majority of people don't know Jesus. The majority of people don't understand what sacrifice means. They'll only see it through, through us. They only see it through other Christians. They see some great things happening, but they don't see the sacrifice that comes from knowing Jesus. Because that's what happens. When we know Jesus, we ask him to come into our life. We ask him to take the toll of our life. And what happens is we're able to pour out our life to others. And that's where the sacrifice comes in. Out of sacrifice comes thanksgiving. So many people, as I said, do not know Jesus in this town, in this region. And it's up to you and I to tell them. Maybe we can take Hannah's lead and pattern this year and pour out our heart to God. Ask him, how can we reach the people in this region? We're not going to do it all by ourselves. It's going to be with the other churches and with other Christians. But how can we do it? Maybe we need to pour our heart out to God this year. And then wait on the Lord and see what He wants us to do as a fellowship. And then we accept God's gift that's given, it's been given to us. The gift of eternal life. The gift of salvation. And then we give it back to Him. Out of sacrifice will come thanksgiving. There's a verse in Hebrews 13 and 15. It says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifice God is pleased. Let's read that again. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifice God is pleased. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we've contemplated and looked at the story of Hannah, and then thought about 2021, Lord, we need to ask, what sacrifice am I prepared to make this 2021? What am I prepared to give up? What am I prepared to do? Lord, Hannah gave up everything. She gave up her only son. And out of sacrifice came thanksgiving. And I pray, Lord, that as we sacrifice ourselves to you, and open our hearts up to you, Lord, that you will enable us to really understand what it means to be thankful. But may we have a thankful heart this year. Lord, we are so lucky for the country that we live in. Lord, we just want to reach out now to our brothers and sisters all over the world that are suffering through coronavirus, through um, disruptions, with political situations all around the world, Lord, countries that just cannot live together, that are always at war with each other. And Lord, we know that the only true peace they can find is through Jesus. And so Lord, we pray for those people overseas. We pray for them, Lord, that they will come to know Jesus, that they'll come to understand what real sacrifice is. And Lord, they'll come to know Jesus as their Saviour. And Lord, we thank you again for the story of Hannah. And Lord, thank you that we can look at that story and learn from it. And realise, Lord, that we're maybe not in such a bad position as we thought. But Lord, through it all, may we recognise, Lord, that we can turn back to you, Lord. We can turn our hearts to you, Lord. We can open and pour our hearts out to you like Hannah did. 
and know Lord, that you are listening and you are waiting and ready to do things in your time. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I just like the guys to close up for the song if that's alright. Um, you got a song for us? Sure. Good on you. Let's hear it.
But uh, please come into court, Neil, as he preaches um, next week for us. And um, have a great week. And uh, looking forward to seeing you all next week. So thank you for coming. Thank you.